April 2010, Iron Acton, just outside Bristol. Police discover the body of a man tied and battered. Things like this just don't happen in a little village. We knew him so well, but when you see to this, we didn't know him so well. Before long, it's become clear that the man had been subjected to a violent and sustained attack. Why would this happen? There's no explanation to this happening. Despite a wide-ranging and intensive investigation, nobody has ever been charged in connection with the murder, and the mystery of what happened still endures. There's been no similar crimes in this area that I know of. It's uh, certainly a one-off, and everybody's completely baffled about it. The first 48 hours of any murder investigation are crucial to understanding what's transpired. Within this narrow framework, the police are often able to identify a suspect and a motive. But what happens when the trail goes cold? We lost someone so dear to us. You get happy memories, but then they're sort of dragged out by this horrible moment it happened. I'm criminologist Donald McIntyre, and in this series, I've brought together an unrivaled team of specialist investigators. We'll work with the original detectives to re-examine and to bring to light new information, and hopefully find some closure for the friends and families of the victims of some of the most shocking and impenetrable cold cases. On this programme, the tragic and perplexing murder of Barry Rubery, whose killers have managed to evade detection for years. We speak to those who knew him, his children and close friends. We review the evidence and the key testimonies from the investigation, and my team casts an expert eye on this seemingly motiveless crime in the hope of learning who killed Barry Rubery. Barry Rubery was found dead in his home in Iron Acton, close to Bristol. No one has ever been charged with his murder, and the motive for his killing still remains unexplained. Now I'm hoping, through a review of the evidence, my cold case team will be able to throw some new light on this difficult and tragic case. Clive Driscoll is a former detective chief inspector with Scotland Yard. He has led many noted investigations over the course of his 40-year career. He has seen many cases like this one and understands its complexity. We've also enlisted the help of Dr Elizabeth Yardley. She's a criminologist and the director of the Centre for Applied Criminology at Birmingham City University. The autopsy report suggests he wasn't excessively had excessive alcohol in his bloodstream. He would have fought back as somebody tried to sort of wrestle him to the ground or, or something like that. You know, he knew how to look after himself. You never fully understand people, you never really know them. I think from the family's point of view, it's it's not enough as a police officer to be doing a good job. You need to be seen to be doing a good job. Yeah. You need to demonstrate to the family yeah. this is what we're doing. Just his body weight alone, for me there was more than one person that was involved in this attack. Despite investigating numerous leads, the police still don't know who killed Barry Rubery. Iron Acton is a quiet Gloucestershire village located about nine miles northeast of Bristol. Roughly 1,600 people live here, and there's a great sense of community and friendship. Barry's house was Crossing Cottage at Latteridge Road, close to the village. He lived here on his own, but had many friends and acquaintances in the area. This is a cottage on the edge of the railway line, uh, not used very often now. It uh, is an abandoned line. There are other cottages in the road, but none very close.
me and my ex-wife, we used to live down at the cottage for quite a period of, of years with the children. So they loved it down there, playing, had the big garden. So the kids used to just sort of like play around there and he was always there all the time. He'd have friends up there, little things. He would take, I don't know, half a dozen eggs up, see a friend, give them to your wife, you know, tell her to bake a nice cake, you know, which, you know, people were very thankful for. Gary was fond of his surroundings. He kept the place well, if a little bit eccentrically, and looked after his property and animals with devotion. I was worked on the, on the land, sort of country, sort of person, really. Um, loved his animals. I had his own little ducks and geese and chickens down there. I always had his two dogs. Drives around a Land Rover all the time. I didn't have anything but a Land Rover. Um, just like the sort of country way of living. He never went away. He felt his holiday was going down the field, sitting down by the pond, especially springtime. And he said, What's, what better place is there to go than here? Why would I want to travel? While at home in his beloved surroundings, the 68-year-old had kept himself fit. For his age, he was a very strong bloke. Again, he'd, let's say he'd be down the field and he'd be cutting up firewood with the axe still and doing quite a lot of manual work, what kept him quite sort of... Uh, in good shape. Barry was divorced, but had stayed close to his children, Philip and Julie. He'd been in a relationship with another woman for some time, and they had established a regular social existence. He was also devoted to his six grandchildren, whom he saw as much as possible. He would frequently have my children for me. They would love to go to him, a typical grandpa. The boy's father, you know, we split when they were very, very young. So he was a big part of their lives, and he was the one that they looked up to as well. So not only was, you know, he was everything to me, he's, he was sort of everything to my boys as well. Best dad you could ever have. In talking to people in Iron Acton, I've also discovered that Barry was something of a go-to guy. If you did a favour for Barry, he would give you two back. But if you give him a favour, he would never forget it. He was always a genuine sort of a bloke. He would always help people. Uh, a lot of people used to rely on him, whether it was for a, a bit of veg or <laughs> whatever. Um, he was always very generous and he was very, very helpful to me. I went through marital problems and he provided me with accommodation while that was happening. He was just a generous bloke. If you got on the right side of him, he was lovely. Everybody sort of liked him. And you very rarely hear a bad word said about him, I think. It's clear to me that having found out a little bit about Barry, he was also a popular guy with good friends and a devoted family. But I've also discovered that Barry was a bit of a trader, someone who bought and sold a little bit. Chancer. Lively lad, no chancer. He, he went short of a few bob, it's true, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't what he would call a businessman, but he knew what he was doing. His favourite title was, I'm a cheap farm labourer, very poor. There's a few times we've gone and picked up some sheets of steel and, you know, you tell me they're a certain length and then you're lucky not to get prosecuted for having them way over the truck when you come back to bring it back, but that's just how he was. A little bit cash on the quilt, and he'd do a deal. We never got involved in anything I wanted. We used to give us free, you know, so we never had a problem. So Barry Ruby was a decent guy, but by all accounts, a man who knew how to handle himself and someone who wasn't adverse to doing the odd cash deal. And my cold case team, on first look, appeared to agree. What kind of person do you think he was? 
Well, Barry Rubery was a real family man. Um, he had children and grandchildren. Um, he, he cared about people. He went out of his way to, to help those within his social circle. Uh, described as a Dell boy, um, but nothing in that kind of, in his interaction suggests at all that anything he could have done could have caused or uh, precipitated his violent end. Yeah, I think the Dell boy tag was just because what he did, he did deal with scrap metal bits. But he was a very industrious man. He built a lake, he, he stocked that lake with fish, he stocked it with other wildlife. He was a very hard working man who'd, who'd you know, obviously accumulated quite a lot of land and, and was doing things with it. But I think the Dell boy tag was more because he did deal with scrap metal every now and then. To be there. I mean, he appeared to be very genial, hugely generous. It's hard to imagine somebody who was that kind in his, you know, everyday dealings with people could come to such a tragic end. Yeah, and I, but I always feel, and I mean, I don't mean this with disrespect, you never fully understand people, you never really know them, and, you know, there, there, there is also information that he did have some conflict with people. I think he was nobody's fool either. You know, certainly speaking to one of the witnesses, he used to enjoy talking and, and you know, if you like, by his lake. But I don't think he was anyone's fool either. I don't think he would have suffered people taking the mick out of him. So what is it about this fairly ordinary guy that would have motivated anyone to attack and murder him in such a violent manner? Had he become involved with people who had a reason to see him dead? Was there something going on in his life that neither his friends nor his family knew anything about? Coming up next, we follow in Barry's footsteps leading up to his sudden and shocking death. 68-year-old Barry Rubry was found murdered at his home close to Bristol. His killer or killers have never been apprehended. Now I'm hoping that with the help of my cold case team, we might uncover something which can help to move this investigation forward. My team has provided key insights on countless investigations. And like many cases of this nature, sometimes the smallest discovery can prove vital to opening up fresh leads. After many years of looking for clues, perhaps a fresh approach is just what this case needs. In trying to get to know what sort of person Barry was, I've been able to rely upon the testimony of his children and others who knew him. And it's become clear that he was a hard worker, someone who could look after himself and someone who had no fear of striking a good deal. So was there anything in his life or habits to suggest any motive for the manner in which he met his death? I've been taking a look at another aspect of Barry Rubry's life, which I believe is significant to the case. It's his membership of an organisation whose affairs are clouded in mystery that I'm interested in. Barry was a proud member of this Freemasons Lodge here in Wotton under Etch and also attended other meetings and other lodges around the Bristol area. I joined Masonry through Barry. Barry joined Masonry about five years before me and uh, I used to speak to him about it and he used to say how he enjoyed it. So uh, he ended up suggesting how I should join and I did. And uh, we both enjoyed our visiting in Masonry then for many years. Freemasonry is a secular organisation based on charitable help and friendship. Because Masons conduct their affairs behind closed doors, and one has to be elected to membership by other Masons, the secrecy of how the organisation operates has always attracted controversy. But Freemasonry was at the centre of Barry's life. The Masons were very important to Barry because he used to enjoy the social side of it, and if he could go out and have a meal somewhere five nights a week, he was happy. Went on a regular basis, done a lot of visiting with his um, uh, friends from different lodges. Um, he'd invite them to his lodge and he'd go to their lodge for the ceremonies and that. So, yeah, he's quite sort of active in that way. He tried to get me involved with it, but I just wouldn't have the time and the dedication to it because I'm busy and I like doing other things and I don't think my wife would be too happy if I spent the sort of time that he did have it. The day of his murder, a Wednesday, Barry spent his time in and around his house. Barry's partner was also with him, but at some stage, she left to go home and pack as they were due to go away the next day. Barry's life appeared normal in the days and hours before his death. However, friends had noticed a change in his demeanor prior to this. 
In the weeks and days leading up to his murder, it seemed his mood vacillated, it changed. On the Saturday before he was killed, he seemed distracted and worried about something. But by Sunday, he was in the company of family and he seemed in fine form. The following day or so, he told his friend that whatever was bothering him had been resolved. There was something wrong with Barry the weekend before it happened. He, uh, I phoned him several times on the Saturday and said, uh, come up for a barbecue, Barry, because that's what we used to do and have a chat about what we were doing and what we were going to do. Um, and he kept saying, I can't get Sandra on the phone, I, I'll let you know later. And I kept phoning him during the day and it didn't happen. And um, never understood why, but when I saw him on the Tuesday lunchtime, I called in and had a chat because I was moving some stuff out of the apartment. And we sat down and he said, uh, oh, it'll be all right now, I'll, I'll be round. So, as if he'd sorted out what the problem was. So how significant is this problem Barry was sorting out and which was clearly something which had been playing on his mind? My cold case team certainly believes it's something which needs to be looked at in far more detail. It does seem as if the, the police, while well, they've done some cursory inquiries and they did interview some, they seem to have kind of parked that as a line of inquiry from what they've told the family. And those, those interactions that he had with people over those, those few days are crucial and the police have to identify all of them. Absolutely every person he spoke to, what did he say? And, and that becomes more challenging the more that time goes on. But the, there is the possibility people will still remember something now. For me, I, I think there's an opportunity of witnesses being available and the police must exhaust every opportunity of extracting all information from all witnesses that can help solve Barry's murder. That's, that's fundamental. On the Wednesday evening, Barry was due to attend an inauguration ceremony and a meeting in the lodge in Down End. But before going, he called in to see Steve Isles. Barry came round in the Land Rover, dressed up to go to the Masons, and he said, oh, Mr. Isles, I can't hang about. I've got your brake or what I borrowed. Can you get out the back of the Land Rover? Because he had his suit and that on. And he said, it'd be a good night tonight, Mr. Isles. You should be coming with me. And I said, well, I'm busy, Bar. I know he wouldn't have been allowed to go to that one because he said it's somebody's inauguration going through the chair or whatever it is. And the installation of a new master, which Everybody tries to attend wherever possible. And we've been going to that lodge now, 10 years and more, once a month, which I, I in turn go to Chris, they in turn come to me. It's a, it's a circle who everybody goes to everybody. He didn't seem worried about anything, just his normal self, really. And that was the last time I seen him. Another Freemason event had also been the location for the last time Barry would see his daughter. My dad had, inv had, had invited me to go to a St. George's Day celebrations um, that the Masons were doing, um, which was um, a lunch at Wooten Under Edge. Um, and it was lovely. We had a lovely afternoon. Um, and it was great, absolutely perfect. There was no problems, no nothing. Um, I dropped him back home, I think, Went in for a cup of coffee, left there around five o'clock. <sighs> you know, the last thing he said to me was, it was a great day, we, we will have to do this again. <laughs> That's when I said, Cheerio. <laughs> and I never spoke to him again after that. It was at the Mason's Lodge in Down End in Bristol where he spent his last evening. There he dined and chatted with other members and by all accounts was in good spirits and really enjoyed the night. His usual mood, we picked him up. He was always waiting for us. Always waiting out just outside the gate. Jumped in the back, no problems, and off he went. That was it, basically. Every meeting we had a meal after, and uh, good hospitality, basically. We 
were in Ken's car, Ken collected me and then we collected Barry. Went to the meeting, came back about quarter to 11. What happened next was brutal, vicious and sustained. Within an hour, Barry Rubery had been savagely murdered and no one has ever been able to explain the reasons why. Coming up next, we learn of the harrowing aftermath of this disturbing crime and its impact on those who knew him. And my cold case team seeks to uncover new details in a bid to discover who killed Barry Rubery. Barry Rubery was found murdered at his home in Iron Acton, close to Bristol. No one has ever been charged with his murder and his family is still searching for answers about what happened to the popular retiree. I've spent some time trying to get to know the Barry Rubery that so many people speak so fondly about. While I've discovered he had a good eye for business and was involved in some cash dealings like trading in scrap metal, there doesn't appear to be anything in his life which could have led to his murder. Why would anybody want to kill this very popular family man? Could he have inadvertently caused offence or was he involved in a financial dispute? Is the answer to this terrible crime centred on his business dealings? Having attended a Masonic function at Down End, about 15 minutes from his house, Barry was dropped home on the night he died by his friends. It was at 10.45pm when his good friends dropped him off at this gate. His close pal Chris commented that it was unusual to see the property in almost complete darkness. It would be the last time that they'd see him alive. We drove past the house and turned round in the entrance to the yard, so that was why I, I looked at the house and sort of thought it was very dark compared to what it usually looked like when somebody was there, and I, that was all that I noticed out of the ordinary. Dropped Barry off and uh, waved out, and that was it, basically. Ordinarily, um, friends would normally go in and have a drink at the end of the evening, but they didn't on that particular evening. It was this that would seal Barry's fate. We didn't see him actually go in the house, because he'd walk, he didn't go in the front, he'd walk around the back, look, around by the conservatory, as he called it. Until he built the room on the back of the house, he'd used the side entrance on, at the front of the house. But since he'd built that room, which was probably a couple of months, he'd been using the back entrance through the garden. Always kept on to come in. Can't Barry, for God's sake, don't, you know, I'd love to went in there. But as you say, I, I like my driving lessons too much. Never did. Now, you, obviously, you regret not going in. Because they say he was attacked pretty quick after that. Within 45 minutes of being left here at this gate, the affable, well-built grandfather was the victim of a sustained and violent attack. The next morning, Steve Isles came over to drop something to Barry. What he found was a grisly murder scene. I walked through the gate, and the first thing I seen was his Masonic case on the floor. I was half tempted to pick it up, but I thought, no, better not, because they, they get a bit funny about things like that, I think. So I just left it. I thought, thinking to myself now, no, he must have had a good night last night being at this inauguration, whatever it was. So I walked through the second gate. As I opened the gate, in front of me, it looked like uh, a load of sick and red stuff, partly covered by the dog's blanket. And I thought, oh dear, he's gonna be in a state, he's drunk. And uh, I thought, I'd better go and check on him now, make sure he's all right. So I walked up to the conservatory door and things are not quite looking right before I opened the door there was like a like a load of blue wire a length of blue wire coming through and there was a shoe over by the over by the hedge something's not right here and I opened the door and I found him just beaten to death But I didn't think I could believe exactly what I was seeing. And then the only person I could see was Joe. Well, it's Joe's, 
one of Joe's workers, Joe's an Indian guy who does a floor screening. And I'm shouting out to him, get Joe, get Joe. And Joe come out, he said, what's the matter? I said, you better come with me. And he said, something terrible's happened to Barry. So we both go back in. Joe goes in the door first. And then he come back, he just, we just looked at one another. And then I said, I obviously got to phone the police. His wrists and ankles were bound with electrical flex and cable ties, and he endured multiple blunt force impacts, which killed him very quickly. Philip Rubri has been showing me the exact place where the attack on his dad began. So he walked around here and he had a confrontation here. So clearly when he opened this door, he had no idea what was hiding behind no, here. No. So and these... Right, it'd be quite unusual really for people to know he's using this door because as I say, it's a recently built um, estancia. So if they're laying in wait for him, then they must have known about his new behavioural habits to go in this door rather they than the other two. certainly seems that way, yes. Or else they were um, informed about that yeah. from someone else who knew. Yeah. The police said that there was a suggestion of a struggle here in this garden space and a suggestion that he was then dragged from here into his home. Those who knew him knew him to be fit and strong and wonder how he was subdued so quickly. Clive, bring us to the events surrounding the night he was killed. They dropped him at the front of the house, which had two locked gates. And we know that at some stage he must have been around where the carport was, because that's where his Masonic case was found. And then there was some vomit, which was just in the garden. So we know that something happened there. And, uh, and then eventually, obviously, that Barry was found tired and trussed in the very small outhouse, which is actually a part of the inner uh, dwelling. The autopsy report suggests he wasn't excessively had excessive alcohol in his bloodstream so i believe from the evidence presented that he was attacked probably as he went into the garden and in fact that uh, resulted in him then having a sustained attack which took his life no sense the house was ransacked either perhaps barry knew something that uh, somebody wanted information from him certainly somebody wanted to cause barry serious harm because that's what the injuries show this was a sustained attack so for me, I can't get the burglary theory because they didn't take enough. After going to that lengths and almost torturing Barry, let's be honest, you know, Barry was tired and at what point maybe we don't know, but certainly a severity of attack on Barry suggests that if they wanted something, they, they would have taken something, which I don't believe they have. This to me does seem a personal attack on Barry Rubery, on what I know. For the Rubery family, the news was shattering. I received a phone call saying there had been a, an accident and I should get back sort of straight away. Um, it must have been around about 8.30ish in the morning. I had to phone Julie because um, nobody had her number, so I phoned Julie to say there'd been an accident down there. And I got a phone call from my brother to ask if anyone had called me. Something was going on at my dad's. And I said, no, I hadn't heard anything. And he said, well, he said, I've had a phone call. Um, we need to get to the cottage. Something's happened. As I drove in, there was just all these people sort of either side. And I can see them all looking at me. And then I saw the, a police officer um, taping, uh, putting tape across so nobody could go over towards the cottage. Um, and then I was just sat in my car and the police came over. Some other people were there, stood there looking in at the window. And she said to me that there had been an incident you know, there'd been some sort of fight that had resulted in my dad now being deceased. 
that I just sat there um, not knowing what to do. It's, my feelings were, you know, this isn't really happening. This isn't, this can't happen. Why would this happen? There's no explanation to this happening. Um, and obviously the day continued and a living nightmare began. Things were made worse for Julie and Philip by the media attention which Barry's murder had generated. People were turning up, there was people running on the roads. You know, to me it was just, you know, you know, why <laughs> why do you need to be here? Just go away. Just leave me alone. Leave everyone alone. It will go away. Of course, obviously it don't go away. First I knew about it is when I actually turned up. I mean the actual Latrice Road is quite a long, you come out of Sharp Bend, then it's quite a long road, and you could just see all the um, uh, police vehicles parked outside there. Um, once I sort of pulled in, they, they explained what exactly happened. So, lucky enough, I never heard nothing on the radio, I think, on the, on the, on the journey home. It took me nearly two hours to get home. So, as we've seen so many times throughout this investigation, Barry was a popular, generous family man. Had he taken something that didn't belong to him? Could the answer be centred around the scrapyard and his business dealings? Was somebody trying to teach him a lesson and things got out of hand? Why would anybody want to murder Barry? Coming up next, my expert panel uncovers a new theory. Could it reveal the true motive behind this terrible murder? The murder of 68-year-old Barry Rubri has baffled investigators since the body of the popular retiree was found in his home in 2010. I've been visiting the area where he lived, speaking to his relatives and friends, and piecing together some of his last known movements in an effort to find out what's behind his killing. My cold case team has also been re-evaluating the evidence and trying to establish if there's anything which might have been overlooked in what appears to have been a very thorough investigation. But while he had no known enemies, I've discovered that in the course of his business, Barry may have come into conflict with some people prior to his murder. This group, believed to be travellers, had by all accounts really upset Barry, who, as we've already heard, was devoted to his property. Barry had an altercation with some young men, youngsters, he called them, on this property some weeks before his death. Who were these men and did they have anything to do with his murder? He mentioned to me that there had been some, what he described to me as kids, making a nuisance of themselves. Um, and he'd had words with them and sorted them out, he said. That's, I mean, I don't know anything more than that, but that's what he said to me. He had a fair bit of land there. and The real problem was he didn't want their vans on his land. Barry also had a personal history with travellers, and this may have exacerbated the situation. His previous partner went off with a, a traveller, and I think there was some problems over that at the time. It's another theory. Could his difficult relationship with this group have led to his death? Police have to be very careful in this area not to prejudice a community because the travellers are often kind of pulled in unfairly on cases simply because they're travellers. I think police always have to show why they're arresting people. I think they have to, there has to be a good evidential process when you, when you arrest people. And you're absolutely right, it would be, would be a tragedy if, if whole communities were just scarred because you know, of, of maybe some careless words by police. Uh, I, I agree very much with what you said, that there are many lines of inquiries, it appears to me, um, and that's one of them. And, and, you know, that's one which I'm sure they're working, they're endeavouring to find the truth of that, but, but there are other lines of inquiries that they need to show that they've also given the same impetus to. You can't just think, oh, I fancy that one, so I'll do that one and not the other one. You have to come to a log logical conclusion about them all, really. Another strange thing about the murder is the fact that the perpetrators were apparently very selective in what they took from the house. 
His attackers took a gold Masonic pocket watch, some keys, a Nokia phone, and an electrical extension cord. However, they left behind items of far greater value, including £130 in Barry Rubery's own pockets. It doesn't seem to make sense if the motive was burglary. So was this a robbery gone wrong? The items apparently taken suggest the people who attacked Barry weren't there for the money, though. Either way, it appears Barry wouldn't have given up without a fight. Barry was no fool. He could handle himself, but I don't care who you are. You could be the best boxer in the world. He'd catch you unawares, get you in the stomach, you're full of booze and food. I think if Barry had gone through the gate and found people there, um, he would not have shrunk away. He would have tackled them, I think. On the night of the attack, there probably was a number of perpetrators. Mm. He, he would have fought back if somebody tried to sort of wrestle him to the ground or, or something like that. You know, he knew how to look after himself. So he wouldn't have gone down easily. There would have been a struggle. Clive, you've always made the sense and you picked out in the autopsy report where, you know, his level of uh, alcohol uh, was quite low and there was no suggestion that, that he was in any way incapacitated. No, and I'd have to say, for me, it's always been where did, where did the, the initial attack take place? For me, the actual whole, if you take it all, all of it in its entirety, just his body weight alone, for me, there was more than one person that was involved in this attack. All of these theories, the involvement with travellers, the robbery gone wrong, have some validity. But in the course of my review of the case, I've come across something quite extraordinary, which I now believe may unlock this mystery. It's something which the police appear to have given little credence to during their investigations. But I really think it's something which could shed new light on this case. It concerns the way in which Barry's body had been left by the killers, something noticed straight away by Steve Isles, the man who discovered it. My first thoughts were this is like a sacrificial job. It, it was a meant job. Arms tied up tightly behind his back with cable ties. I'm sure it was his right leg was tied up and wrapped, and he, his body was wrapped in wire, but his, his right leg was up, the trouser leg was partly down. And I didn't recognise his head because it was just beaten to death. I, I didn't recognise him. It was just a mass of blood. I've been working with criminologist Professor David Wilson, and we believe that this could lead the investigation back to the organisation at the centre of Barry's life. Barry Rubri was found uh, trussed up in a sacrificial position. There was certain, there was certain evidence on his body that um, suggested a Masonic ritual. For example, his trouser leg was rolled above his knee. And of course, Barry Rubri was a Mason. The, the, Mason. the Masonic Lodge was part of his life. And given the fact that there's nothing stolen, there's nothing missing from his body, then that begins to make me want to look at those Masonic connections as a, a focus for the inquiry. So is what happened to Barry in some way connected to the Masons or some sort of ritual? Or did his killers know of his masonry and were they trying to deflect attention from themselves? Or did they even perhaps just set out to mock Barry's Masonic connections. The Rubri family have always felt that they were being kept in the dark about the progress of the investigation into their father's death. For how much information we get told is very little, um, except for new intelligence has come in. They are working on that, but they won't give us anything more so than that. You don't really sort of hear a lot. Um, uh, unless we sort of phone up and they say there's been no change on progress that they're making at the moment, but they are still working on things. For me, it's really frustrating to know that they're working on people, if you like, um, 
And do I know these people? I don't know. I think from the family's point of view, it's, it's not enough as a police officer to be doing a good job. You need to be seen to be doing a good job. Yeah. You need to demonstrate to the family yeah. this is what we're doing. And, and you can't really put a price on how valuable that is to a family who, who still are looking for answers. The reward has been dropped from £10,000 at the time of the murder now to £2,000 for information. Now, that leaves the family in a very uncomfortable position. You can offer a £10,000 reward and pay out £2,000. That, that's how the system works. You don't necessarily get the full amount. So why have you caused yourself that amount of difficulty with the family? I can't... That, that seems to be, to be clumsy. But I think in this, this case, the police do need to sit down with the family and explain why they're not going to pursue a particular inquiry, which is concerning the family. And after all, that's their dad. You know, they, 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 we have to show that we're doing everything. I've come to see Philip and Julie Rubri to tell them for the first time this new revelation about their father's murder. I'm conscious what I'm going to tell them will be upsetting, but I feel it's something they should know. The suggestion that we believe that we've heard from a number of sources and from Steve Isles and also from Joe and from another source, um, obviously Steve found the body was that it was a very ritualistic, sacrificial position, a suggestion that a signature, uh, a Masonic signature, he was trussed up and his trouser legs that was brought above his knee. The position was not too dissimilar to that which had been found in, uh, suggested to be uh, Masonic punishments. I've not heard this before at all. And the key thing we talked to Professor David Wilson and the key thing here in all of this is that the, the strange position of the body, hint of sacrificial position, the, I know it's very difficult, Julie, it, is, it just moves it into a different arena, brings his life as a mason into it. Well, I for sure would like to know why they've not picked up on this. I'm hoping now that this new information may at last make Philip and Julie feel that they're part of the investigation into their own father's murder. Whenever I speak to the family of murder victims who are disgruntled, they are disgruntled because they don't get information that they feel they should have got and which potentially might help catch the culprit. The family, until I told them, had no idea about the position which Barry was found in. And you know, the description from the witness, Steve Isles, was that this was a sacrificial position that remained, uh, reminded him of something from uh, the world of uh, Freemasonry. And that's why that there has to be a thorough investigation to the family's satisfaction, because all, the whole time that is there, they will worry about it. So the, 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 the police will have pictures of the scene and sometimes police do hold back information and evidence because they want to make sure that evidence that's coming to them is pure. I, I, can, I can get that. The one thing about communication is, is that there is none. I would say what the police should do is go to the Freemasonry and, and says, well look, this is, is this one of your ceremonial positions? Is, this, is it? And somebody needs to put their name to a statement to say no. Having spent time in Iron Acton and time with Barry's friends and family, I've seen the personal trauma this case has visited on so many people. I was having nightmares. I would see Barry as I'd seen him last. Then I'd see Barry as I found him. And then you just think to yourself, God, if I was there, it, did it happen not long before I got there, I could have helped him. All those sort of things, really. He was my rock. Um, I could always turn to him for anything. Because you learn to accept what's happened, because you got to, and you tried to get on with life. But it's every day, something sort of happens and it makes you think. You get happy memories, but then they're sort of drained out by this horrible moment it happened. I've also discovered that there's more to this case than I at first thought. 
To start with, I've no doubt that had the police probed too deeply into the affairs of the travelling community or indeed the Masons, they would have been accused of persecution of one sort or another. And this may explain their reticence. As for the murder itself, I think we've pretty much established that it wasn't a robbery gone wrong. But was there a vendetta against Barry? Did those who murdered him know of his Masonic connections? Were they involved with the Masons themselves? Just what was it that led to such a brutal and savage killing? Years have passed since Barry Rubery's murder and still no one has been brought to trial. His death still continues to traumatise those close to him and haunt the community where he lived. But the more I've learned about Barry's life before his tragic and what appears to be ritualistic death, the more I'm convinced that the police need to start their reinvestigation by looking closely at the traveller connections in Barry's life and at the secret organisation he spent so much of his time interacting with. For all the theories related to this case, there is one certainty. This was not a random act of violence. This was planned. This was an act of design. He knew his killers or knew those who ordered the killers to be present. The question is whether the motive is related to his business dealings, his work in the community, or even perhaps his membership of the Masons.